It is now truly my pleasure to introduce to you this year's honorary chair of the AAGL Congress, our past president, Dr. Paya Passage. Paya needs no introduction to so many of you because he is the embodiment of the AAGL and we all know him. The honorary chair should be, by definition, someone who has demonstrated a sustained commitment to the AAGL. And so when it was my turn as president to choose an honorary chair, there was really only one person to choose and that was Paya. So like many of you, Paya is the reason that I became involved in the AAGL. We were giving a lecture in China many years ago before I was ever really involved with AAGL. And he spent a whole plane ride sharing Jordan Phillips' vision of an organization that propelled its members to grow and teach and change the world for women. And as many of you know, Dr. Passage has spent his lifetime doing this. He's a motivator and a multiplier. He's traveled the world teaching surgery literally everywhere. And his impact, paying it forward, is immeasurable. He's the reason that surgeons in many areas of the world have learned laparoscopic surgery. And he's the reason that women in many areas of the world have access to MIGS. He's trained decades worth of residents and fellows in minimally invasive gynecologic surgery, and many of them are leaders and teachers themselves. It is of this that he is perhaps most proud. I'm proud to call Paya Passage my friend, and you know he'll do anything for you anytime. So without further ado, it's my honor to welcome Dr. Paya Passage, the 2020 Honorary Chair of the AAGL. Hello, I'm Paya Pasek, and I'm greeting you from Louisville, Kentucky. I would like to thank Dr. Jubilee Brown for nominating me to serve as the honorary chair of the AGL's 49th Global Congress on Minimally Invasive Gynecological Surgery that is this year taking part virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm honored for this privilege. I have to admit that I first took this news with uh, mixed emotions. Uh, my thought was these uh, honorary talks are usually given to old people and a grim uh, reality started to sink in that I'm actually old. My wife was more pragmatic and she suggested that I look at it more as a life achievement award. So then I started to search for a topic of my talk in a consultation with my fellows. I decided to talk about evolution of minimally invasive surgery that I have witnessed over the past 30 years. Therefore comes this title, paraphrasing Roman statement Cicero, uh, that used the Latin proverb historia es magistra vita to, person of, to personify history as life's teacher and to convey the idea that study of the past can help us understand the future. There are close to 500 AGL fellows that have already graduated. There are 99 current fellows and 55 incoming fellows. Some of those fellows are not barely 30 years old. And my talk should be designed primarily for them by understanding the past of our field and our organization, they can better understand the future. So I was first introduced to laparoscopy in the 80s during my residency at the University Hospital in Sarajevo. Uh, my chief of staff or chairman was a brilliant surgeon. He learned laparoscopy for Kurt Sem, and he was doing primarily diagnostic laparoscopies. We would all lined up in the line to watch him perform laparoscopy, waiting for our 30 seconds turn to look down the scope. And first time when I looked down the scope, I was mesmerized. I just couldn't, you know, I, I, was, I was so uh, excited to see the inside of the human body to laparoscope. At the end of the surgery, he would wash the scope, put it under his arm and just leave saying, this is very expensive piece of equipment and it's not for everybody. And this is how we used to do these surgeries before, or actually just diagnostic procedures. And then a few years later, I ended up in Louisville, Kentucky, working with this gentleman. His name was Mac Wolf, God bless his soul. He was 
amazing surgeon. He was uh, actually uh, serving in Korea as, uh, as a doctor and uh, he adapted laparoscopy very early. So uh, this was our fancy laparoscopic tower. You can see big CO2 ca uh, container. And then you can also see a uh, uh, SEMS insufflator as well as the aqua purator. And uh, at that time, we had laparoscopic cameras, but you can see how big they are. We had to suspend them from the ceiling because they were too heavy to hold them in your hand. And we also did a bunch of uh, diagnostic laparoscopies. And you, as you can see, just using a room air, a just this is a small pump that's attached to the, to the trocar. And you see there is a flashlight attached to the laparoscope. And we did a bunch of diagnostic laparoscopies this way. So it's laparoscopy is not really a rocket science that you need. Well, I mean, of course, you need, if you to do very complicated procedures, you need complicated equipment, but this is, you know, how to do it very simply. At that time, we also did a lot of tubal ligations under uh, local anesthesia. And uh, the only instrument that we had for coagulation was so-called SEMS coagulator. So in this instrument, there was a, a point coagulator and the instrument in the middle uh, represents the crocodile forceps. There was no electricity going to the patient. The electricity would go to the coils within the instrument. And then you would fire the instrument, let's say on top of the IP ligament. It would take time for those coils to heat up. So you can walk out in the doctor's lounge, have a coffee, have a cigarette. Yes, in those days, you can even smoke in the hospitals. Then you come back and you're ready to fire and cut the IP ligament. And then these two gentlemen, actually invented the bipolar coagulator, Jacques uh, Rio and Richard Kleppinger. And they revolutionized the field of minimally invasive surgery because at that time we could, we could actually burn the, the pedicles and that helped Harry Rich perform the first hysterectomy. So in 89, I also met Dr. Levine in Louisville and he introduced me to Jordan Phillips because my uh, my idea was really to uh, organize an, a meeting in uh, Yugoslavia when I, upon my return. So upon my return to Sarajevo, I uh, raised the money with the help of my father-in-law and uh, who was CEO of a big company and my other friends. So I bought the fancy equipment, but my chairman wouldn't let me operate. So I did my first surgery at two o'clock in the morning when I was on call and lady showed up with ectopic pregnancy. And that was actually the first ever surgery done in Yugoslavia in 1991. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, I wanted to organize we, the meeting in, uh, in the Dubrovnik, Croatia. Most of you know of Dubrovnik and, and uh, it's actually a place where Game of Thrones was filmed, but it, what, which is very relevant for Dubrovnik is that uh, Dubrovnik was the first place in the world to start the quarantine. In the, when bubonic plague hit Europe in the 14th century, Dubrovnik actually established the quarantine where all the ships that would come into the city had to stop at this island and people would have to stay for 40 days. And that's a, uh, the word quarantine starts from a Latin or Italian word quaranta, which is 40. And, uh, uh, now it's a prime tourist location in, in the world. And I wanted to organize the meeting there. So Jordan came in, he didn't have to go to the quarantine with Mary Phillips. And we dis decided how to organize the meeting. We actually made the plans how to uh, get the meeting in 1992, but unfortunately the war started in 1991 in Sarajevo. My hospital seen here on the right, on the left was completely destroyed. Building where I worked was also, where I lived was also destroyed. My father was killed during the war. And then I moved back to US in 1992. At that time, we already had better equipment, smaller cameras, and uh, I started working at U of L. So it was Max's idea, he told me, why don't you start doing laparoscopy on uh, cadavers with residents? 
And uh, that was actually a great idea that completely changed my uh, future career. I would take residents to the cadaver lab. We had cadaver lab where general surgeons would eviscerate cadaver and they would practice surgery. Then we would take that same cadaver. I would just suspend it to the ceiling, uh, the, the, the abdominal wall as shown here and take residents to do the, uh, the dissection. This picture is 25 years old. Actually, we were the first one in the world to start laparoscopic surgery on cadavers. So this was Max idea, but he didn't want to do it. So he pushed it on me, which actually reminds me of the stuff that I don't want to do today. And then I very often push to my fellows. Sometimes they're great ideas, sometimes they're not. This one was great. And then Ron Levine started the first course in uh, laparoscopic uh, cadaver dissection. And here's the, uh, the front page of, our, uh, of that uh, uh, syllabus that time. I didn't even make the front page at that time, although I did uh, do a, uh, most of the work for it. And then there I met my buddies and partner, partners in crime. Next to me is uh, Bob Rogers, who also independently from us was doing cadaveric surgery and teaching uh, anatomy and cadavers laparoscopically. And then we formed the organization called IMET, Innovation in Medical Teaching. And we started traveling the country every every two months or every month, we would go to a different place, go in the hotel, uh, bring in cadavers, put the security at the door, and then work on the cadavers, leave next day. Next day, they'll probably have a wedding in the same place or so on. And we also did the uh, first uh, course for GYN oncologists. And down there at the bottom, you can see uh, a picture from our first course where Dr. Magrina, Jubilee Brown, Yukio Sonoda were our faculty. But I want to talk to you about vision of Jordan Phillips. Jordan Phillips was a gynecologist in California. He saw the pioneering work that Kurt Sem did, and then he sold his practice, bought a minivan, and started traveling the country promoting laparoscopy. And in 1971, he actually formed or uh, AGL and uh, uh, the first meeting of AGL were only four people. So these are the founders of AGL. This picture was taken during my presidency. And uh, unfortunately, Jordan uh, died that year. And then uh, there were uh, these other gentlemen, only uh, uh, Dr. Rick S Dick uh, Soderstrom is uh, with, uh, alive with us today. The other gentlemen have, have passed. And so he created this amazing organization where I've met a lot of great people, excellent doctors, and we became great friends. And on um, the picture to the right, to my uh, right is uh, Dr. Cameron Najad, who was the first one to apply video laparoscopy and actually help us develop this whole field. And uh, genius of Kurt Sem, who was a German physician that started doing laparoscopy and, and, and had many inventions. One of them was uh, the current insufflator that we use, as well as the, uh, uh, the suction irrigator. And the instrument down in the bottom is actually the first uh, morselator that was actually a uh, manual morselator. So the next picture is uh, uh, Kurt Sem with his uh, colleague, Dr. Lilo Mettler, who is amazing, fantastic lady, and she's still going strong. Uh, uh, and for all of you female surgeons, if you are ever looking for a role model, don't look anywhere beyond Lilo. She's a great surgeon. She was Olympic medal uh, winner in swimming. And her and Kurt Sem in three years period came 89 times to America to teach laparoscopy. So just for, for, for your reference, how many of you in the past year have, have gone to the neighboring state? Nevertheless, 89 times across the ocean coming to US to teach laparoscopy. But everything was not uh, smooth sailing for laparoscopy. Kurt Sem was actually summoned for psychiatric evaluations, for his progressive views that everything, all surgeries can be done laparoscopically. They made him 
get a CT of his brain. And even in my career in the 90s, when I was giving grand rounds, I was introduced by a chairman. Dr. Pasek is now going to talk to us about charlatan surgery. But the worst damage to our field was really done by a very important guy, Dr. Roy Pitkin, who was in the, who published this uh, editorial in Green Journal. He was a chairman at the USCLA uh, and also was editor of the Green Journal, who in 1992 published this editorial saying that ev no evidence uh, uh, supports the use of laparoscopy in anything but tubal ligations, adhesiolysis, and, uh, and the uh, ovarian cyst surgery. So Dr. Pitkin was a very known maternal fetal medicine doctor. He probably hasn't done many laparoscopies, uh, but he had a power to write this article. And that would be similar to myself now who has done 15 years ago, probably last delivery, if I would write an editorial about obstetrics. What could I say about obstetrics, except that it's very boring and bloody. And Dr. Pitkin actually went further and accepted this article that shows laparoscopic vaginal delivery that was actually a satirical article written in a Green Journal about uh, using basketball net crowbars, dog, uh, dog leeches for laparoscopic delivery. And uh, uh, to, to, to his credit, Dr. Pitkin, 18 years later, probably uh, under the influence of uh, our ex-president Bill Parker wrote another editorial where he basically said that there is enough evidence to sustain that laparoscopy was uh, that can be used in gynecological procedures. But originally he made so many people pissed off, including Jordan and the uh, leadership of AGL that they decided they'll start their own journal and the journal of uh, uh, American Association of Gynecological Laparoscopy was started on November 1993. So when we're looking back, Harry Rich did the first hysterectomy that revolutionized the, the field of laparoscopy in 1989. The first robotic hysterectomy was done in 2001. And then in 2002, I ended up doing that meeting that I eventually wanted always to do and Jordan came to Dubrovnik as well as Harry Rich and Kurt Sem. And you can see in this picture, two uh, great uh, uh, figures of minimally invasive surgery, Harry Rich and, and uh, Kurt Sem. And I was there with them, uh, just aspiring to be a good surgeon. And 30 years later, actually, I have done the greatest, the biggest uh, laparoscopic hysterectomy in the world of 7.4 kilo uterus for only under four hours and less than 700 cc's of blood loss. All of that on fellow side. No, I'm just kidding. My fellow was great. And uh, looking back when, and the uh, laparoscopy then went to space. In 1996, there was the first uh, live surgery transmission of laparoscopic surgery. And then something was really fascinating, the first international transcontinental robotic surgery took place in 2001 uh, where the surgeon was in New York and the patient was in Strasbourg, France. It was laparoscopic cholecystectomy by the general surgeons. It lasted 55 minutes. The patient was 9,000 miles, 14,000 kilometers away from the surgeon. And there was a, the time lag was 1.5 milliseconds for the for the robot uh, to move from you know the transmission lag. So I, uh, and this was with the genius of Jacques Marceau, who was a, a French surgeon. I have to tell you that laparoscopy was started by gynecologists. We are the ones that did invented laparoscopy, started all the procedures, and then general surgeons got on board and they've actually taken it to the next level. So anyway, Dr. Marceau's vision was to start the IRCAD teaching place. And it was, it was actually sanctioned by French government. And they did first IRCAD in France, in Strasbourg, France. 
the second one was done in uh, Taipei, Taiwan, then in Brazil, and the fourth one now is in Rwanda. So they have, they bring all these great surgeons, gynecologists, orthopedic surgeons, general surgeons, everybody to this teaching center. And by far is the best institution, teaching institution in the world. And I was very lucky to actually have been invited by my friend Arnaud Vatier, shown down in the corner, uh, to actually teach at the IRCAD for over 10 years now. And uh, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. I took five of my fellows there also. And this is the list of my fellows that I'm very, uh, very proud of all, all of them and uh, of their achievements. Uh, the take home message from my talk would be, you gotta have a vision in order to be successful you have to be you have to be uh, uh you have you need perseverance you have to be very stubborn and just push forward all the time you got in order for the for that you need passion you need substance it's not just to talk the talk and walk the walk you gotta walk the walk you can just you know you have to know the knowledge uh, and behind all of that is hard work you need some networking still skills and on top of everything, you need some luck. So that would be my talk and the message for the young surgeons uh, who are members of these great organizations. Thank you again for the privilege. I wish you everything best and please stay safe.